Hey guys, welcome back. Schizone series, episode 30. Topic today is going to be parsing and then evaluating expressions in postfix notation, aka RPN. Very easy. Here's today's example. I just want to show you really quick. We'll have a binary that we'll make that we can pass in math expressions. So I could say binary 6, 6 plus. Again, that's postfix. So that would evaluate to 12. I can also do times. I can do minus. I can do divide. All those things evaluate correctly, but also we can do more advanced uh, expressions. It's like you could say pi and then sine. That is the sine of pi, obviously. We can do pi over two. So pi two divided by sine, that's one, correct. I can do um, exponentials. I could say e to the power of pi, 23. That sounds right to me. Um, you can do square root of that, right? And so you can do a lot of cool things um, with this, and it's very easy to implement this. That's the beauty of postfix notation. So let's go through how this works. What is postfix? If you don't already know, you probably do, but you have an expression like this, and basically the, the idea is that operators follow their operands. And so for this expression, 3, 10, 5 plus times, this plus applies to this 10 and 5, 15, 15 right? And then this times applies to this and 15. So that's how that works. So you get 45. Simple enough. Um, so there's no rules, no parentheses for grouping, and no associativity, right? Obviously, plus and times, they're commutative. You can, you can switch this and this around, for example, and it would be the same. But for divide, minus, and power, et cetera, it's not associativity. Like, it's not like... So it doesn't work both ways, right? So yeah, that matters for infix, but not for postfix. And then because it's so like linear like this, it's trivial to parse. You just have to go straight along the string, consume characters and put them in whatever category you think that they are and evaluate the operators on the operands while you go. So very simple, just use a stack. So if you look up parsing, this kind of stuff in infix or even in postfix, talk about tokenization is everywhere. And the question I have is why? There's no tokenizing required for this. Like that's only required if you have to like store this somewhere. You don't have to store this anywhere. You can store this. I mean, you can evaluate this as you go. Just consume characters of the string as you read it. So start here. Hey, this is all numerical characters. So this is a number. So this is gonna be 5.4 as a number. And I have a space, so this is, a, you know, skip this character, and I have this as a number. So I should just push this number onto the stack and uh, yeah, call it a day, right? Push this number, push this number, add them up. So very simple. Um, so you basically, the idea is you keep going until you hit a null byte at the end of the string, so it's a null terminated string and uh, we already have most of the functions required for this. So we made already in the past a parse float function that consumes literally this. It just it consumes characters until it finds one that's not numeric. And it works both on this notation, regular like 5.43, but it also works on scientific notation, for example. So you can put like 1e7, and that also is a number, which is cool. Um, and also one thing here is there's nothing about ints. You may have seen from this that six plus six evaluated to 12.000000. It's because there's everything is evaluated as a float. There's no integers in any of this, which makes it cool because, well, you don't have to implement any of those integer math type things like modulo or whatever, just the floating point ones. So keep it simple. Um, yeah, that's the idea there. If you want to see this is where it's implemented, we'll go through that a bit today. So a couple of key details here is that for those more advanced terms besides plus minus times divide power, I have this basically a kind of a table in memory, I call it an operator table with 12 operators here. Some of them operators, some of them operands, but we basically set aside eight bytes for the name of whatever it is. So this is sine followed by five null bytes and then cosine and five null bytes and E followed by seven null bytes. So it's an eight byte chunk of what this string even is. And then there is a 
function pointer, basically, of the implementation of that mathematical expression. So, for example, the addition one is implemented as this. Basically, you grab a number off the stack. So RSP is the stack pointer. So we can grab a quantity that is uh, just behind our return address, and then the number just behind that, add them together with this add SD and put them back where the first operate operand was. And then this at the top here, this I call this the post operation stack adjustment byte count. This is basically how much you pop off the stack when you're done. So normally when you hear about like post presentation, the idea is that you um, like you'll, you'll push onto the stack five, push on the stack six, then you'll pop six, pop five, add the th things together. That's fine. The problem is the way I implemented this with these function pointers is that we're using the basically the, the call stack to implement this um, evaluation. And so because of that, there's always a return address in between our parsing function and the evaluating function. It's an address there. And so we have to kind of work behind that address without messing it up. And so, yeah, the idea here is that you kind of access things behind the return address. So offset eight, offset 16, and you put the answer back offset 16. And then when you're done, you pop off. So when you get back to the main function, you'll look over here, what's this quantity? And then just add that number to the stack pointer. Don't worry if it doesn't make sense, it, it might in a few minutes. Um, and then here, for example, is the sign implementation. So whenever you, you are consuming the term sign out of your string, you'll basically call this function pointer here, where you are basically calling our trigonometric approximation for the sign, our Taylor series approximation for this trig function with a built-in tolerance value there. And uh, you can see there's no stack adjustment consumption because sign doesn't consume numbers off the stack, right? If I said sign of 5.43, I would basically put the answer where 5.43 was. So there's nothing, there's no stack adjustment when you're done. So yeah, that's how that works. It's pretty straightforward. Um, that this number of the stack adjustment byte count, that consumption value we just talked about is always one byte before this function pointer. So you can access that from this table as well. So it's pretty simple. Um, and also this is the, all the operators. So sine, cosine, tangent, arctan, square root, inverse. So like one over natural log, log base 10, exponentials, and then we have three built-in numbers, e, pi, and tau. So you can call those as well, and they just basically put those values on the stack. So now, go through an example um, in <laughs> deep detail here, just to show you the process of how this is parsed. So here's just an example of math problem here. We want to evaluate the length of this right-hand side. Um, and so you have an angle, you have two lengths, this is just going to be a sine um, problem here. So basically this angle here for the degrees or pi over six. So this is what the string would look like. So pi six divided by, so pi over six, sine of that quantity. Then we're going to push 10 and 2.34. That's going to be this length here. Add them together and then multiply this length by the sine of this. So this is how that expression would look in postfix notation. So how would we parse this? Well, first thing that happens is you look at the very first character in the string. Um, it's a known string, so you usually have two known characters followed by a space. So this is a known string here. And so we're going to look in our operator table, find pi, do whatever pi says, and pi says push pi to the stack. So we'll push pi to the stack. Then you advance the character past that known string, so your cursor now points to this space. That's a space, so you skip that character and advance the cursor. Now you point to a six, so you detect the floating point value six, and you push that value to the stack. You can see here. So then you point to six, you, you then advance the cursor past the number, now you point to the space after the six. It's a space, so you skip, now you point to the division sign. That's a built-in operator. What does that do? It divides operator at stack depth one by operator at stack depth zero and place the result on the stack. So basically, we have six, we have 3.14, we're gonna divide pi over six, put that value back on the stack. And it's gonna consume that eight byte quantity, it's gonna be a value eight for the division. This is gonna be built to understand that we have a, 
offset of eight after that's uh, consumed. So that happens there. Uh, or you can just do the push or the pop, pop, push approach where you pop the numbers and then evaluate the answer and push the answer back on the stack. That also works. Either way, when you're done, you advance, advance the cursor one to the space. It's a space, so you skip. Now you point to the sign. So that's a known string from that operator table. We'll see SIN matching that table. Then we'll do whatever it says. It will compute the sign of the operand at the stack depth zero and place the result at the stack depth zero. So sign of 0.52 is actually 0.5, it's a half. Um, and so that will be on the stack at this point. And we're gonna advance the cursor past the known string to the space, it's gonna be a space, so skip. Then we have a 10. So it's a number, push 10 to the stack. And you advance the cursor past the number, you point to the space. Again, it's a space, skip the space, 2.34. So you, that's another number, push to the stack, push the cursor past the number, again, it's a space, move on to the next character, that's gonna be a plus, that's a built-in operator. That's going to add the two th values at the stack depth one and zero and put the result back at stack depth one and consume eight bytes. Or you can use the, the pop, pop, push again. So that 10 and two become 12. Then you advance the cursor, you get a space, skip the space to a, the multiplication symbol. And again, you multiply the two values at the on the stack, put the result where the first one was. Advance the cursor, and now you have a null byte. Again, this is a null terminated string, and you return that value. And of course, a lot of times this might go awry. If you, if you have a bogus expression to evaluate, it's gonna break. So you have to be careful as to what is a, a valid expression, but um, once you have one, it will evaluate just fine. And of course, this is commutative, and so is this. So you could move a lot of these things around. You could swap these two, you could swap all of this with all of this, it would still um, evaluate just fine. And also, um, a lot of the spaces could be removed. You could get rid of this space here, I'm pretty sure. You can get rid of definitely this space, probably also this space. Yeah, definitely that space. So a lot of the spaces could be removed as well. I think even this space could be removed. So yeah, um, different expressions would evaluate the same way as what we have here. With that out of the way, I will go into the examples. You already saw one of them. The other one was evaluating an input file. Um, so let's show that. Again, the first example, just go through really quick. We had the ability to consume these characters and evaluate the expression. I'm gonna type in our expression from the example just here. So let's see what that evaluates to. Let's kind of check our answers here. So our expression was, let me scroll up pi 6 divided by sine 10 2.34 plus times and there's that 6.17 value again it's a floating point quantity so it's going to be approximately there um, of course it won't be exactly right because we have a tolerance built into our sign our taylor series approximation for the sign function has a tolerance so we're not going to get the exact answer we could have built in like hey yeah sine of pi over six is supposed to always give us um, you know, a half, but we didn't do that. We could do that at some point. And like I mentioned, you could probably remove some of these spaces. We can get rid of that space for sure, probably that one as well. That still works. Um, this one should also work. Maybe a few others as well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe this one, that one works. Looks kind of weird though. Six divided by sine, looks kind of weird, but that also evaluates the same way. Now, the other example we have was example B. This one, uh, we have an expressions.in. So if I open up expressions.in, you'll see these are all the expressions I want to evaluate. So five, five plus, that should be 10. Pi sine should be easy to compute that. Same with the following couple. Um, just to show you the different expressions that we can handle. And this last one should give us an error because you can't divide five by nothing. That should put some kind of error on the screen. And so if I run this, um, or if you just run the binary. So run assembles and runs. I have now a binary that I can use. So if I just run the binary on the input file, so expressions.in, and then I put the output file I want here, answers.out, I'll have an answers.out file. I can open up, let's open up everything here. Or let's open up at least uh, expressions.in and answers.out. 
So those are the expressions and those are the answers. So basically it just appends to the input string, the result. So here you can see what these evaluate to, five, five plus is 10, obviously pi sine is zero, obviously that weird one is seven something, um, 144 square root 12 minus, that's zero, two to the power of 10, that's correct. And then for the bogus one, it says it's bogus because it's bogus. So yeah, um, we can parse expressions. There's almost a lot of doors for us. We're, we have the ability now to basically um, implement math, not at compile time, but at runtime, essentially. We can pass in an expression and evaluate it when the program is running. So that opens a lot of doors for us. Obviously, it would be nice to use infix notation. We're all familiar with that. But this one works just as well, and it's a stepping stone in that direction. A lot of the times when you parse infix, you're parsing it into postfix first and then evaluating. And so this basically is the first, is the second half of that process. So let's look at example A again and go through just what's going on here. So I'll open up the code as well as I'll open up the um, actual function that we're calling lib. Uh, math, expressions, parse, grab everything in there, a couple bogus things, but we'll just close those. I'll close the guard. skip that for our next video. <laughs> um, yeah, so here's the code, basically, and if you saw, I forgot how big these were. These were like around 10K, 10 kilobytes, that is, for the program. Most of that is printing stuff. So the ability to print things out is the majority of that binary static file size. Printing floats is actually not a very simple thing to do, um, as well as printing characters in general. So there's that. Uh, we also have some other things we're using like sterlen and this postfix uh, string evaluation procedure. So what happens here? Well, as usual, we have to grab things from the command line. And so we have this argc start pointer that varies between Linux and BSD. So if you don't pass in two things, at least as a command line input, it's uh, you're dumb and you should be punished for it. So it just, it leaves the program. If you do pass in two, that is you pass in the function name as well as an input string, you can now evaluate that length of the string and then parse that string. And so that's what happens here. Uh, take a look if you want for the code. Basically we just um, call our parsing postfix string function, it returns a Boolean. I'll talk about that in a second. If that Boolean is such that it indicates that our expression was bogus, just also leave, give an error message, otherwise print out the answer. That's kind of what's going on here. And then in this evaluation function that we're calling, a couple other of includes things that deal with consuming and evaluating string properties. So like comparing strings, you have to obviously compare if you know, S I N matches whatever you had. So, Hey, is this a sign? Is this a cosine? Is this arc tangent or whatever? Right? So that this is required for that. Sterlen is required for how long each of those operators is. And then stir split is also required to, to break things out and split them. So how does this work? This is basically the implementation of the logic I just showed you in the example. So we're looping through, we're consuming spaces, consuming different, um, numerical quantities, looking for negative signs versus minuses, that's actually a little bit amb ambiguous. Is a minus sign, is it an, a negative? Um, so requires some thought there. And it loops until it finds the null byte. And so if you don't pass in the null terminated string, this will go on forever. Um, so yeah, we're, we're calling this parse flow expression. That's how you grab out the numerical quantities. Um, and this is just the exact logic I just described to you in the example. I won't go through it in detail here, but I will go through the other included function, which is the stack math ops. This is basically what enables you to evaluate these operators on the operands inside the stack. So underneath the return address. And so here's that table I showed you before. Um, of all the different operators and operands that we want to hard code in besides the built-in ones, because built-in ones are obvious, everyone wants those, but you may not want these. You may not want arctangent, you may not want exponential. Maybe you want some other functions. Maybe you want some log base two or something. Hey, fine, um, you can do that. 
just change that and change the operator count and then redefine the uh, function pointer down here and the string obviously. Only requirement is it has to be less than eight characters long for the, the string that you're using to indicate this uh, operator. Why is that? It's because I've only given eight bytes for every string. So sign is three bytes of real letters and then five bytes of zeros. Anyway, I've put everything in here. So addition, subtraction, multiplication, it all is the same process. So for addition, you're grabbing uh, operator, sorry, operand from depth. I guess it would be two on the stack, adding it to depth um, one on the stack and putting the answer back at depth two. And then you consume eight bytes when you're done. And again, this is only because on the stack, there is a return address between where you are when you get to this label in memory and where your actual operands are on the stack. So we're using the call stack for our expression parsing. So yeah, we have all those defined here. It gets more advanced for functions like, so obviously square is the easiest one. There's a built-in floating point SSE2 instruction for square root SD. We can just call that on a value that we have off the stack and put the answer back. That works just fine. But for things like power, where we have to implement another, you know, Taylor series expansion to compute that, or exponential or sine, cosine, tangent, arctangent, et cetera, or ln or log, we have to call an outside function. Um, so that's all been defined. And we have this tolerance defined in memory at the bottom of this, you can see here, we have a defined value for the tolerance. So whenever we call sine or cosine, the Taylor series approximation will be accurate to within this small number. Then what else do we have? We have a couple of constants built in here. We have e, tau, and pi. That's obviously so you can just return those values. So let's say someone passed in e in their expression. Well, this is what evaluates here, this dot e label, and this puts your constant e on the stack at that current address. So it pushes that value onto the stack. And that's defined here in uh, hexadecimal. And this one at the top, what is that for? Well, that's for the inverse function. So inverse is right here. This basically puts one in x minimum zero, divides your stack quantity by that one, and it puts the value back on the stack. So you can do like a one over x evaluation with the inv uh, input or command, whatever you want to call it. So that's pretty much it. The only difference is, for example, b, when I run that, or when I ran that on the input file, we had that um, an output file. So that's pretty much the same exact thing, but the difference is we're opening the input file, grabbing the, let me show you. So for this example, we're opening the input file, opening the output file, and obviously they're different because for the input file, it's read only. Output file is going to be possibly create. If it's not already there, you have to make it as well as sys truncate if it's going to be written on top and also read write as well. So there's all that. And you have to basically parse values from those uh, input files, parse expressions from them. And you can see here, I've, I'm pulling 80 bytes from the input, into an input buffer from basically that, uh, that string on that line. Besides that, it's the same exact logic. I'm not gonna go into it. You can look at it if you're curious. And if you use it wrong, it gives you an error message. So that's good. With that out of the way, I'll end the video. I hope it's interesting. It's very quick to implement this. It probably took me across like two days, probably like two hours per day. So it wasn't trivial, but it was one of the easier things we did on this uh, project so far, the Schizone project. Thanks for watching. Um, hope you had fun. See you in the next video. Thanks.